Konnichiwa and welcome to episode 47 of the Leadership Japan podcast and I'm your host in Tokyo, Dr. Greg Story, president of Dale Carnegie Training Japan and much, much more importantly, you are a student of leadership, highly motivated to be the very best in your field. If you would like your own access to 102 years of the accumulated wisdom of Dale Carnegie training through free white papers, guidebooks, reports, training videos, blogs, course information, plus much, much more, then go to japan.dalecarnegie.com. And today we are going to have a session on engagement. This was a workshop given about how to get more engaged employees. Some great ideas, a bit of insight into some of the key aspects about engagement. We'll get straight into it. We'll talk a little bit about Dale Carnegie. I'm sure most of you have heard of Dale Carnegie. We're celebrating our 101st year in operation. 1912, we started in New York City. And it's quite remarkable. One man, one class, and it's now global. It's incredible that it's gone that well and that long, and there's pretty sound reasons for that. This book has been a big part of it, and actually today we're collecting your Meishi, collecting your business cards, we're going to draw three lucky winners. We've got the choice in either Japanese or English, depending on what you like to read the book in. You've got the Japanese version as well. Hito Vukasu 2, it's called, in Japanese, so look forward to that. And so this book has been very important in getting the idea of people relationships, people skills, implanted into business. It's still classic, it's still selling tremendously. In fact, people in the publishing business, not only in Japan and globally, they tell me that there are basically two super long sellers in the publishing world. One is the Bible, the other is this book. And if you think about it, look back in say the 60s or 70s, 80s, books that were very popular, they're all gone. They're still in the top 10, business, non-fiction, genre, still doing your own, because the need for better human relations is still with us. And so that hasn't changed. In fact, uh, in Japanese side, this is a new book, it sold 9 million copies in Japan, and that is a lot of copies. So again, very, very successful, well accepted in Japan, well accepted, it publishes more than 50 languages around the world, so working very well. And we're very fortunate that 90% of the biggest, most powerful listed companies, at least, the Fortune 500 companies in the States, use our training. And that's a really great recommendation for what we do. And in Japan, too, uh, we're very strong. We're actually now 91 countries. This is going to change to 97 in a few months, but it's still 91. As I said, one man, one class becomes 91 countries in more than 30 languages. It's quite remarkable. There's strong reasons for that, and that is it works, it's universal, and it's timeless. So we're very proud of that. As one of our greatest fans, many of you will know Warren Buffett is probably one of the most successful investors in, in history. And he is a tremendous fan. I don't know about your country. <coughs> Maybe you can afford to pay Warren Buffett to front for your enterprise. We can't. <laughs> He's a billionaire multiple times over. He's pretty expensive. But he does a lot of promotion of Dale Carnegie for free. The reason is very simple. When he was a young man, he was like the smartest guy in his class, amongst very bright people at the university. He went out on his own to start a business. And he discovered that even though he was very bright, he was very great with investing, he was a different animal to get people to give you their money to invest. And he discovered that Communication skills, persuasion skills, people skills were critical, and he was struggling. He was struggling. He said, you know, I killed myself at university, and I'm the top of the class. I've got these fantastic investment ideas. I'm going to make a lot of people a lot of money. And he has. He has made people a lot of money. But he wasn't getting any takers. He took the Dale Carnegie course on the suggestion of a friend. He said, hey, Warren, take the Dale Carnegie course. Changed his life. Changed his career, and he is often being interviewed, and this particular shot here, so this is uh, CBS, 
is actually pointing to his diploma. And he mentions in the uh, clip, you know, I don't have my university graduation diploma on my wall. But I have my Dale Carnegie graduation certificate. The reason is because that actually is what launched his career. And so in Japan, we have some big fans too. The ex-chairman uh, of Coca-Cola, Tony san ex-chairman of Google, Tony san and uh, ex-president of Johnson Johnson, Atarash san are big promoters of Dale Carnegie. They do a lot of speaking, they do a lot of writing. Because again, for these gentlemen, when they were younger, they got involved with Dale Carnegie in the course, <coughs> participant, they graduated from the course, and it changed their career. It changed the trajectory of their success. And they still recall that as being one of the big turning points in their life. And so again, we don't have to pay these gentlemen any money because they do it as a volunteer, because they believe in it. And so it's very powerful for us. And amazingly, uh, I asked America, because we do, and you'll do stuff today, a little bit different questionnaire today, but we have a sort of standard questionnaire after our courses. And we send these off to the stage, and they put it through this big machine, and we get the results, and we can check any course in any one of those 91 countries around the world, trainer against trainer, and to see how the total quality index is looking, see how the scores work, do some comparison, make sure we're operating at the right level. And I don't know why I'm so dumb, but it's taken me a long time to pick this out. I just realized the other day, gee, if you ever seem to get some numbers on what's the satisfaction rate? Because we see it course by course, but I don't know, five years is a reasonable time. Five years, long enough period of time. Okay, I'll make it hard for myself. I'll make it all courses. A two hour module, a whole half a day, a day, three days, a week, the whole works. Everything we do, no matter the degree of simplicity or complexity, put it together, and I'll do it for all instructors, every one of our trainers. So five years, everything. What's the satisfaction rate? And that's the number that came back, 97.7. So I must say, I knew it was going to be high because I see the, the uh, reports as they come in, but I think it's going to be that high over a five-year period, so I was very glad to that. That says something about the quality that this organization has created over the last 101 years. It says a lot about Donald Carnegie the system that he's come up with. So we're going to go into a little video. Who's heard of Southwest Airlines? I think a lot of people have it. Why are they well known? What's Southwest Airlines well known for? What are they good at? Cheap tickets. Cheap tickets? What else? Hot pants. Hot pants. Hot pants. <laughs> Sounds good. What else? <laughs> I want to make sure I heard that one. They made a profit every year. Made a profit every year. What else are you doing? High quality. High quality, high retention, high customer satisfaction. So let's have a look at this video and get some ideas about are your staff engaged? Are the staff at Southwest engaged? Good evening, folks. Welcome aboard Southwest Airlines Flight 372, service to Oklahoma City. Those of you that have flown us before know that we do things a little bit differently on Southwest. Some of us tell jokes, some of us sing, some of us just stand there and look beautiful. I, unfortunately, can do none of those. So here's the one thing that I do know how to do. We're going to shake things up a little bit. I need a little audience participation. Otherwise, this is not going to go over well at all. So, here's what I need, especially you guys in the front, because you know what's coming. All right, I need a beat, all right? All I need you to do is stop and clap, and I'm going to do the rest, because I just, I've had five flights today, and I just cannot do the regular boring announcement again, otherwise I'm going to put myself to sleep. So, you guys with me? All right. So, give me a stomp, clap, stomp, clap. Come on, stomp, clap, stomp. They won't be there. There you go. Keep that going. This is flight 372 on SWA. The flight attendant's on board serving you today. Teresa in the middle, David in the back. My name is David, and I'm here to tell you back. Shortly after takeoff, first bits, first there's soft drinks and coffee to quench your thirst. But if you want another kind of drink, then just holler. Alcohol and beverages will be four dollars. If a monster finishes your drink, it's your friend that'll be three dollars. And you get the whole thing. We won't take your cash. You gotta pay with plastic. If you have a few on, then that's fantastic. We know you're ready to get to new places. Open up the bins, put away your suitcases. Carry all items go under the seat. In front of you, so let you have things by your feet. If you have a seat or a roll with the cake, then we're gonna talk to you. So you might as well expect it. You gotta help us out your way in case we need you. If you don't want to, then we're gonna reset you. Before we leave, our advice is put away your electronic devices. Fasten your seatbelt, then put your trays up. Press the button to make the seatbelt raise up. Sit back, relax, have a good time. It's almost time to go, so 
very much for my beat. I appreciate that. You will not get that on United Airlines, I guarantee you. Do you reckon that's in the manual? Do you reckon he memorized that from the manual? I don't think so. Do you think the Southwest Airlines says, okay, from now on everyone's going to do a rap song? I don't think so. Do you think that guy's engaged? Why do you think he's engaged? His passion, yeah. Was that creative? Who do you reckon wrote that rap song? Himself. <coughs> he did, right? He sat down and he thought that up. And does it take a bit of guts to get up in front of people and do that? You have to have self-esteem. You have to have confidence to do that. When we say the guy's engaged, yes, we would. So we have to think of this as a great example. I'm not saying that I'm going to see my team do a Dale Carnegie with a rap beat or anything in the future. I can't see that in my future. Probably not in your future either. But the point is, if we want creativity, if we want innovation, there's got to be an environment to encourage that. If there was a senior executive of Southwest Airlines on that flight, and he heard that song, and he said, rap song? What? That's the end of it, right? That's where the creativity is going to die, right there. And the innovation will die right there because they're squashing it. But in this company's case, it's the other way around. They're encouraging it. So it might be an extreme example, but it still says something about the capacity to tap in the innovative power and creativity of people in our teams. So today, this is what we're going to do with our objectives. We're going to redefine employee engagement from the employee perspective. Now, this is very key word. Hi, welcome. Please come on in. Sorry. Right at the front of you. Just yes, keep the house. There you go. The employee perspective. Often in companies, we have the management perspective. We have the financial perspective. We have the process perspective. We have the compliance perspective. What about the employee perspective? So we're looking at engagement, we're going to start looking at this from the employee perspective, but a little bit of a different starting point, perhaps, than normal. And have a look at your own ideas about what is employee engagement. What does that actually mean? Because I'm sure all of us would have our own individual opinions, and they may be quite various in what we think that constitutes. But let's start with ourselves. If you can't understand yourself, it's very hard to know what you're going to do with the team in terms of getting that engaged. And then we're going to try and look at what's the relationship between engagement and team success. <coughs> then look at some techniques. We're going to get, and it's a bit small on the writing here, so I've got my glasses on here. I'm a mistress if you read it. But it says, <coughs> treat employees as valuable people with skills rather than as people with valuable skills. Let me just say that again slowly. So we're sort of switching ideas with you, right? Treat or think of employees as valuable people with skills rather than as people with valuable skills. Hear the difference? That's a bit of a semantic difference in English. It's just a different way of looking at our teams. We see them as valuable people and skills are part of the functionality of how they work rather than they are just something. Human asset. I love that term, our human assets, as opposed to our laptops or our desks or something, our other assets. This is taking a bit of a different view on that. So we will now have a bit of a think about what, what does an engaged employee look like? And I'm going to ask if you can find a pair or three people just where you're sitting, just look for people around you. And have a little bit of a discussion together for a few minutes on what, if we were looking for someone who's engaged, what would that person be doing? What would they be saying? What would they look like? How would we identify amongst a huge range of individuals who is an engaged employee? We've got a big company, a small company. How do you spot the ones who are engaged? What are you looking for? So please find someone to work with in pairs or threes, it doesn't matter, and have a discussion about. What would that look like? Please go ahead. On the engagement definition. You want to give me some ideas? How do I spot? I'm on the hunt for an engaged employee. What am I looking for? Do more than their position. Okay, they do more than their position, yeah. What else? Ownership and initiative. Want them to have ownership and initiative, that's great. What else? 
Ah, coming up with fresh ideas. Great. What else? Smiling and having fun. Sorry, what was that? Smiling and having fun. Smiling and having fun. They look like they're happy, right? Yeah, that's important. It's actually a good one to spot them. What else? What else? Okay. So they're able to bring other people with them. Some of them make their enthusiasm becomes infected with other people. It's great. What else? Initiative in taking conversations. They're maybe raising ideas, raising points, maybe questioning systems processes, looking to improve. What else? What else? Sorry. Ah, how do they feel rewarded? I get a salary every month, right? <laughs> what else? They feel recognized. Okay, so it's not just money, is it? It's recognition. Now that's a that's a bit of a sore point, isn't it? Because uh, and if, and they're looking for those intimate conversations, so it goes beyond just productivity in general. But they're looking for some way they can find the value of the contribution to the project. Not productivity or innovation, so much as just getting involved. They want to get involved. They want to have more say in the direction of the organization. They want to have more responsibility for the success of the organization. They want to have more control of their work life. Yeah, all of these things. We did a survey of engagement, and these are some of the results that came up. This is done in America. Fully engaged came up as 29% of the survey. Partially engaged is 45, and disengaged 26. So how does that compare? So a similar result from the Gallup organization compared the same fully engaged, partially engaged, disengaged between the US and America, and their results are a little bit similar to ours. They have 29, 54, 78. In Japan, you know, see, seven percent were fully engaged, 68 partially. 25%, and one in four actually disengaged. And then we did a little bit more comparison. This is the Dalai Lama, one I just mentioned, and then uh, the Dalai ones are on the right, and then also Blessing White in the States also did uh, some work on engagement as well. And their numbers again vary a little bit, but not that big a variation, actually. Maybe this is a bit larger variation, but the Gallup numbers are sort of interesting. Excuse me. Yes. Please. Uh, in engagement, you know, we were talking about this, and uh, uh, there are these kind of terms that you cannot really, you know, translate it into Japanese. Uh, yeah, I know. Except no. for engagement, engage them to win. Like, you know, yeah, engage them to win. Other than that, and I, uh, look I agree. Really further, and it's, in fact, it says engagement. Yeah. And that is a great point. That we struggle, you know, like we said, we're going to do this engagement seminar, right? Well, let's. Cut a cut. And then it becomes meaningless. You know? And you're right, it is a very difficult word to translate into Japanese. And believe me, we have struggled to come up with a word. We cannot find a word in Japanese apart from the katakana of engagement of the words. So it comes around to concepts. It's very interesting. The Japanese word is just not there. It's suitable. There are lots of close words, but not a Have you got a great word for us? What is it? No, I don't. So taking an issue, taking response is not culturally acceptable, so therefore there's no word for it. That's fine. That's fine. That could be the case. But we, we certainly we could not come up with a word. But we could come up with some ideas, as you just did before, about what it looks like. So even if there's no particular kanji that sort of works for us, just a, a katakana of engagement that works, because we come up with some ideas uh, around that. I'll just show another one here, which is Towers Watson. They did a slightly different version. They did highly engaged, disengaged, unsupported at work, and detached. And so what they've talked about here is they've said, uh, if you're unsupported at work, 
you want to work harder, but you're not given the tools, the resources, or the support. So you have the desire, but no one cares about you, basically. And this one detached is, well, uh, you don't have the desire. Right? So when they looked at this split, they came up with some results between Japan and global in their comparison. So we see, we see how things go there, that uh, there is some, some change. Now, this is a definition that we came up with to try and explain what is employee engagement, which comes back to your point about how do you get it into Japanese. So we've basically given up trying to find a kanji for this. And we just say we go for engagement, but let's give it a meaning that's relevant. This is the meaning we've come up The emotional and intellectual commitment of employees to deliver higher performance. So that's our definition. On page, on page two of your manuals, which is this page here, page two, see here. There's a section there. I know it's a bit difficult to write on your lap. Sorry about that, but give it a go, or just think about it. What's your definition of engagement? Have a go at coming up with your own definition. Have a think about that. So we've got our definition. You might have a different take on it. Yes. No manuals at the back. No manuals at the back. Okay. Yamata san. We have some manuals, please. How many do we need down there? Three. Three. Three manuals down there. Thank you. Wasn't in your pack. Right? Okay. You got all the propaganda and no manual. All right. Okay. So please uh, put down some ideas on what your opinion on what your personal definition of employee engagement. We've got ours, but what's yours? Okay. If you've got your definition down, please share it with the people you were working with before and get some feedback on how they looked at it and how you looked at it. So please share and just trade off your definition. Please go ahead. Uh, normally, you come to events and they say, you know, turn your phone off, blah, 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 but we actually got to use your phone. Is everyone packing a phone by any chance? We've got a room full of iPhone holders. Turn it off. You can turn it off. So actually, we're going to do a little poll here. We're going to use our phones here to vote. It's a polling question. So, which of these do you think is going to have the greatest impact on employee engagement. It's actually on, it's on the screen. So, competitive compensation and benefits. I get paid a big bonus. I'm motivated. All right? Satisfaction with immediate manager. My boss is great. Support of work-life balance. Hey, I got an aging parent. I got kids. I've got things in my life outside work. Belief in senior leadership. These people are the captains of our ship. Fortunately, they're good. And they know where they're going. Opportunities for advancement. There is a career path for me in this company. I can see a future in this company. Pride in the organization. I'm proud to hand out my business card with this company's name on it. And finally, free popcorn. This is very American. Free popcorn in the break room. If it was Australia, it would be free beer. But there. So what you can do, if you've got an app that allows you to take a photograph of that QR code, just do that. If you haven't, just punch that into your browser. Punch that into your browser and it will take you to a voting site. Okay, we have 44 responses. So Dylan, we have 44 responses. As you see here, the uh, highest scoring one was number six, pride in the organization. Second one was number two, satisfaction with immediate manager of 25. And then we had 18% was opportunities for advancement. So that's very interesting. <laughs> what we found from our research, and it's pretty close to what you've come up with, matches the Japanese. So we found these were three drivers of engagement. And so we did this in the States. In fact, we've completed the research for Japan. They're crunching the numbers in America right now. And probably will have the results in about two weeks' time. I'd be very interested to see how that compares on the engagement, you know, not engaged, partially engaged scores. But interesting enough, the Japanese group who did this, and yourselves too, very, very close, you know, in terms of the, the, the key indicators. We found these three drivers to be particularly important for engagement. Satisfaction with the immediate manager, pride, or well, belief in the senior manager, pride of organization. And this satisfaction with the immediate manager is things around, as you mentioned before, 
recognition. Right? Recognition. Uh, how you feel you're being treated, you're being valued. The belief in the senior leadership was, are the captains of this ship actually going in the right direction? Is this company going to be okay? Are we taking the right decisions? Is senior leadership communicating to me where we're going with this? Or am I lost? I don't know where we're going with this company. In fact, we've got a client, not in this room today, but we've got a client where they are being bought. They just don't know by who. They're not quite sure when it's going to be concluded. And they've got a massive engagement problem. And people are leaving. People are leaving. Now, good people are walking out the door because that company cannot provide any belief in senior leadership because they themselves do not know where they're going or what they're going to be doing. So that may be an extreme case, but you may have the same problem, that there's not enough clarity in your organization around where we're going with all this. You're finally pride in the organization. right? So you feel some ownership. You feel you've got some say in where we're going. You feel invested with where we're going with this. So we found these three drivers to be particularly useful. And as I say, compared to your scores, it's pretty close. It's not that it's not that far away, actually, when I look at it. Just the advancement one is about the only one that sort of came up. So if we think about that, um, well, this is a good question. Why? Why is engagement important? We know these are drivers. At least three of those are very common. Well, what's the importance of We've also, in our research, we found a few things. That high engagement organizations outperform by as much as 20%. They have better shareholder return. And they have lower turnover. Now, very interestingly, we've been through quite a rough patch around the world. And America's no exception to that. Yet even despite that, the retention is an important aspect companies because the costs of replacing people are very high. In calculations, whether it's going to take 1.5 of a person's salary in recruitment costs to replace them, there's a number of costs associated with that. There's also a big cost, probably 11 billion of uh, turnover affecting the, the cost of business. So it's, it's big money. So these elements give us, actually it's 202 percent, I should say, these elements give us some Satisfaction that engagement's worth it, uh, that it's important. And I think about Japan, I was at a function yesterday, and I have to check this number, but the person who was speaking said the expectation was, and if there's anybody in the audience who knows this for sure, that Japan's current 5% unemployment rate in the next few years will go down to close to 2%. So 5.8, I think he said down about 1.8. That has some major ramifications. For companies, if you're going to have less people available to do the work because of the declining population, uh, well, retention is going to be critical because you're going to be losing people to somebody else, and you're going to be losing uh, potential ones who could be highly engaged, but someone else is going to keep them in their company because they've been able to tap that engagement feeling. So we've had a, a rough patch in Japan, and so maybe it hasn't been an issue. But even you see this year with university graduates for the first time in a long time, they're starting to get jobs relatively easily after graduation. It's really a lucky draw in Japan as to when you graduate as to how easy it is to get a job afterwards. And it's been very much up and down. And we're now getting back to a stage where it looks like there's more competition for graduates. So that will have a ramification in companies so we have a big amount of retention. So we need to look at these things and think about where we're going to go with that. So, uh, <coughs> we know it's critical. What does it mean though? In fact, uh, as I said, you said before about there's no Japanese word for engagement, right? This is a stroke. But we can, maybe we don't have the word for it apart from the katakanaized version of English. But these are some things we can see that actually tell us what it means. The fully engaged, they stay. They stay longer. They have built up a lot of information. They know the processes, they know the clients, they know the system. They're very important pillars of the organization. As people come in and go out, they stay. They become the core, the glue. They contribute to the bottom line because they're working well. They're working effectively. And they commit productivity and quality. Now, Japan, especially in a white-collar 
field is often criticized for low productivity. White collar workers in Japan have generally got low productivity. You go to a Japanese factory, a uh, well run factory, and trust me, they're working hard, they're working fast. But we don't see that same degree of productivity so easily for white collar workers. And also, quality. And as we get in a more competitive environment, being able to secure the quality of your brand, the quality of your service or product, becomes more and more important. So you want people who are fully engaged to have those attributes. What's the difference for those who are partially, partially engaged? Well, they concentrate on tasks, not outcomes. Has anyone worked in a Japanese company where people are still there at 10 o'clock at night? Are you one of them? And have you noticed that people are hanging around waiting for kacho or the bucho to go home? Seen that. We've seen plenty of that, right? So they could go home earlier. They get a much more productive work life, but it's this very low threshold over a very long period of time. And that's what that problem comes in terms of um, they're worried about the task, they're not so much worried about what am I producing here, what's the quality of what I'm doing. I'm diligent, I'm loyal, I turn up, I'm regular. I don't do much, I don't produce much, but I'm loyal. Well, that's what you're getting in partially engaged. And if you're happy with that, stick with that. But if your competitors get the engaged people who are actually getting outputs, you're going to have a big problem very, very shortly. And uh, they want to be told what to do. And this is very interesting. We often have this discussion around, well, there are there was a, a group, a tribe of, of particularly Japanese people who don't want to think for themselves and are happy to be told what to do. Now, some people have that view. I don't necessarily have that view, but that is often a view that's given to me. That, well, that's why Japan is different. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. I don't have to think. That may be the case. It may not be the case. But I'm sure if we can get an engaged workforce who wants to think. Your point before, right, about think deeply. Where are we going with this? Where can I make a difference? How can I contribute? How can I take us to a more competitive level? There's a certain degree of engagement there that you're not getting out of this room. They do it, they get paid, and they go home. <clears throat> now, this is an American survey. But you can understand. A lot of people turn up in this country and get paid, work hard, diligent, go home. I mean, this is the only country in the world where people will stand on the street in winter when it's freezing cold and raining, handing out tissue packs. If that was Australia, those, the whole boxes would be in the dumper somewhere, you know? They'd be down the, they'd be down the pub, you know, with a nice rum or a whiskey or something warming up. But here in Japan, they're very diligent, you know? They, they turn up, they get paid. But we're talking about something beyond that. This is like a minimum, right? We're talking about something beyond that. That's partially engaged. Now, you've got the disengaged. So in this group, well, so seeds of negativity. This is the, everything that's wrong with this business, this industry, this company, this section, uh, the people in it, the boss, whiners, you know, complainers. The world is dark and gloomy and the glass is definitely not full, but I'm not happy and I'm going to spread my unhappiness as far and as wide as I can. And then you've got, well, I don't know we get too much sabotage uh, and progress in Japan, but um, still, it may be sabotaged by non-active involvement. It may be sabotaged by well, What happens to that first group over time, though? They're highly engaged. They want this organization to do well. They see the direction it should go. They think senior managers not going in the right direction. They're doing their best to correct it, and they're ignored. What happens? How long can they sustain that, do you think? What happens after all their good ideas are dismissed, not recognized, ignored? Uh, they're doing their best, they're sincere, but they're not appreciated. How long does that last? They'll go somewhere else, right? They'll, they're part of your retention problem. You don't want to lose those people because maybe your senior management's not transparent enough. Maybe your management system's not inclusive enough. And the second one about these are productive people that could be in transactional roles, like a trader, for example. Uh, they're making lots of money. They may not need to involve a lot of people. They can be producers themselves. 
Do you want that person in charge of other people? Why not? They're productive. They're, they're producing. Do you want to in charge of others? So are they ever going to be in the leadership? Who do you want in the leadership? Maybe you want a different animal. Maybe you're a different person. So yes, there may be somebody who is, uh, you could say disengaged, they don't care, but they're, they're doing well. There may be a role for those people, but they are not someone who's probably going to build your leadership team. They're probably not someone who's going to contribute in other areas of the business. And usually, are they very cooperative with other parts of the company? In the silos of companies, are they the sort of guy or gal who goes out there and works with the others from other groups? Usually, you know, so there's a gap between the company direction and their personal belief and direction. Right? And why would that come up? Why would you get it that way? They weren't involved in the decision making. They weren't involved in decision making. Was there good communication about the why? Now, I'm sure many of us are leaders, managers, and we're all busy people. Anyone got a lot of email? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone doing a lot of meetings, right? So often our communication gets truncated down to very short sound bites about what we have to do to execute. And sometimes the why may be lost or forgotten or not articulated. <coughs> So you just get told what's going to happen. You don't get actually told why that's important. And so over time, when you get that type of management, you start to get a lack of communication around where we're going and why we're doing it. And people just get told, here are the numbers, hit these numbers. So it could be that uh, they don't feel engaged because they don't really feel part of it. They don't understand the point, and they have their own views. So yes, it could be the cultural assessment. It could also be uh, other things as well. Last one is they express mistrust and animosity. Okay, that's pretty harsh. That's pretty harsh. But has anyone ever whinged about their boss to somebody else? Come on, put your hands up. <laughs> Every single one of you have done that. Come on. Okay. You're doing it now. Come on. For the ones who are doing it now, put your hands up. We all do that. So when we're disaffected, we tend to spread the disaffection. We want to we want some sympathy. We want you know, someone to listen to us and people who are in our work circle will understand best the frustration that we're facing, the problems we're facing, so they're the best audience. So don't be going home to your husband or your wife or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or whatever, or your parents and whinging to them. They don't get it, right? They're too far removed. It's much better to do with the people you work with. They understand, yes, you're right. Yes, I know what you mean. It's a very good audience for that. Yeah? So they can have a, a, a big impact. So what I'd like to do now is think about People you know, it doesn't have to be people you work with necessarily. It could be your friends. Uh, it could be someone you worked with in the past. It could be someone now. It could be your boss. It could be a supporter. It could be a colleague. Who you would say is, yeah, this person is fully engaged. And think about someone who's actually not engaged. We'll leave this one out for the moment because it's sort of we'll get the extremes. Someone you think is, wow, this person, they're really, they signed on. And uh, this person, they, they're signed off. So in your groups again, have a discussion, and think about people you know, and then talk about what are the attributes that you're seeing there that differentiates one from the other. Let's go. Now, if it's someone in the room and you want to use a code name, that's quite acceptable, all right? Uh, but if you don't want to say the person's name, you just want to reference someone, that's fine. You want to say their name, that's fine. Who do we find in our experience we thought was, wow, a really engaged person? Do you find anybody? Anyone find anyone really engaged? Yeah? Okay, so what was engaged about that person? Well, the, the reason I thought they were fully engaged was that they, they put all their effort into the job. They really made a big effort in terms of uh, the, the quality and the relationship with the customer. It was a training manager, actually. And they were consulted a lot about everything by people above that level. And also, they were trusted. So that was my analysis of that. <laughs> Anything else? Who else finds? Does that mean there's only one person's entire crowd is not someone's engaged? Oh, I was describing a um, a uh, sort of like, sorry, an internal IT person in our organisation, and um, obviously it's, uh, our, our organisation is primarily a sales organisation. So there's a lot of people that are very motivated you know, by various things. But this uh, this lady, um, I didn't think her boss was particularly uh, inspiring to, to generate motivation. Um, but she was always really, really responsive to uh, any requests. Um, 
always happy and smiley. Sorry, did you say this was an IT person? <laughs> Unfortunately, she's no longer with our organisation, but, um, but she was with us for a while, um, and uh, I think she did contribute because she, you know, she was always uh, you know, speedy response, trying to help you, and, and you know, provide a different definition of there, that sort of thing. And why did she leave? Um, I think, but I think personal like family reasons. But I mean, that was something she gave to us. Whether that was the real reason. Mm -hmm. What a gem! Yeah. I mean, Anyone find an IT person like that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. We're talking rare, rare, rare things. <laughs> Let's switch it now, and this is the good part, right? We can all deal with the really bad, disengaged people. <laughs> Any examples of people you work with who are disengaged? <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> So has some accountability, yeah. but isn't totally signed up. Well, maybe a bit of a, a flip here between the partially engaged that they, you know, they, they do their job, but he may be he may be sort of in between those somewhere. He lapses into you know, areas of negativity between doing what he's expected or she's expected to do. I mean, these are broad definitions. Of this. And what we're looking for here is trying to understand what's the difference between these. Now let's try and understand ourselves a little bit. How about you know where we're going with this? So just before we get to that, in fact, this came up before about the uh, other part about the ages. We found that in the research that the uh, clients who are facing us, <laughs> the general public, the consumers, um, have the uh, lowest engagement. So obviously, dealing with people, uh, you know, as the as a, the clients, is that's a hard part of the job. And basically, first five years goes up and then starts to stagnate. And they show some age brackets, sort of, you know, 50s and up, and sort of up to the sort of 30s, quite strong in engagement, that sort of 30s, 40s, partially 50s, starts to taper off. And then finally, enthusiasm. Equals extra effort equals organization success. These were what the research findings came out. How about yourselves? In your manuals, you have on page four a little self assessment piece, there, four or five. So, how are you going to think about yourself? So, when you look at your own score, how do you react to that? Do you think that score is reflective? Do you think that's accurate? Just in your groups, have a quick discussion. Is that score accurate? Is that for you think no, actually I am more engaged or I'm less engaged? And also, <laughs> what does your level of engagement mean for your team? So have a look at the score that you're giving yourself. Is that about right or not? And then think about and discuss what does your level of personal engagement do in terms of impact on the team? Either the team that you're part of or the team that you're the the leader of. Okay, let's have a discussion on that. Let's think about leadership, the importance of leadership and engagement. We've got some nice quotes here for you. Some of you will know Charlie Ergen. He's actually uh, having a nice fight with uh, Son Sun at the moment over Sprint. Uh, he's trying to buy it in the States. And he belongs to, he owns a company called Dish. There's a quote from uh, Frontier magazine. He's a street fighter. Website 24-7. The meanest company in America. This is Dish, by the way. A former professional poker player who strikes fear into employees and battles rivals, says the Financial Times. Staff clocking with a fingerprint scanner so HR knows if they are late. Pick up a few ideas for the HR people in the room, right? <laughs> I don't hold myself up as a great manager. Who wants to work for Charlie? He's a billionaire, by the way. <laughs> Multiple billionaire. He's been very successful. He's made a huge amount of money. But how do you reckon the engagement levels of his team would be? How about this other one? Now, I don't even know how to pronounce this. Yannick Nezet Seguin. Are there any Canadians in the room who recognize this composer? He's a Canadian conductor, I should say. Talking about music. <laughs> Playing through fear. He's absolutely against the spirit of music making. He's a conductor, right? He's in charge. It shuts down the emotional level. As a conductor, you want to encourage people to express themselves as they would wish. The person's perspective, we talked about earlier. 
You have a power of persuasion. You need to be sincere, honest, well prepared. Your power is psychological. Very interesting contrast between two leaders. And I can tell you, I definitely don't want to work for Charlie. You know, this is probably easier to absorb as an individual. Charlie's very rich and successful, but how do we feel ourselves when we're on the receiving end? He's an entrepreneur and he owns the company. So he's, I don't know, Charlie, but from what I read, he sounds like a pretty tough guy to work And so, yes, he's been very successful over the, you know, literally over the bodies of the people who probably work for him. So he could so have been more successful. You're in the process of being one of those people to make Charlie. So it's like, you know, you know, uh, you know I say, I'll, I'll, pick, I'll pick Dylan. Right? Louis will be say, Dylan, you come in early, go home late. Work diligently, actually work weekends. Really put in a big effort. Make a lot of sales. Really hit the numbers. I'm going to have a big bonus. Is that it, motivated? Now, for these guys, Charlie's making a lot of money. What about the people who are in the team? <coughs> are they making a lot of money? I don't know. So, it depends what you like. I mean, yes, some people will be successful regardless. I mean, Steve Jobs is often held up as an example of a great American leader. But by all accounts, he was horrendous to work for. He was a brutal, vicious leader. And yet, he was a great innovator. And he came up with new products, which we're all using. So, he's a success. Now, yes, there's always going to be outliers. It depends who you want to work for. It depends how your people feel about working in your organization. And can you get that degree of motivation? There's different ways. I mean, you know, the military, fantastic. The military is fantastic for getting compliance. It's a very, very strict world. You know, it's very hierarchical, it's very set, it's very clear, very good rules. You can have that type of organization. It'll get you at a certain point. It depends what you need. So I guess the 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 answer here is, what do you want? What's your organization's need? If it's going to be very hierarchical, very structured, is that going to work in a competitive business that you're in? It may. I mean, Charlie Ergen, as far as I understand, has been a tremendous deal doer. He's made a lot of money through doing deals, and the people have been a means to the end. So, if you're one of those people, <laughs> I wonder what the engagement scores look like down that uh, dish. Uh, our research has Highlighted something's a bit different than what's been common before. Most research on engagement is around the statistics of all. Oh, this is the engagement, or this is the <coughs> not engagement section, or the partial engagement. It's tended not to look at what's driving that. And this is where we started to look at the emotions behind engagement. And so, exactly, you know, Charlie Ergen, like the, uh, could not care less, probably, about the, the people. So his emotional concept about people is probably close to zero, and there are lots of managers like that. What we found in the research, though, is that at this point in time, in this era that we are now in, that is changing. When I was growing up, a uh, leader had a very clear segregation between work and professional interest in person, and that person's personal life was completely differentiated. They did not think that they could go into that person's personal life because that was their life and this is just work. What the research is showing, though, is that people are changing. And what they want is to be valued. They want to feel valued. And they want to feel valued and they want to feel appreciated. And they want the bosses to have a bigger interest in their personal feelings. This is what the research is showing. They want to feel that the boss cares about how they feel. They want to know that the boss cares about their health, right? which is maybe a bit different from before. So when you look, as you say, you look in the survey, I mean, there's some interesting questions in here that probably have not even been issues of the past. But in this modern day and age, you know, my manager recognizes my contributions. Not very common. I'm satisfied with the input into decisions. Not so common. Interest, my manager is interested in me as a person. This is rather new. I mean, we have not seen this in previous engagement studies. So we've looked at the driving emotions behind engagement, the sorts of things we're encouraging, that people have a different expectation to them. And these other things too, like, you know, the corporate philosophy reflects my values. 
my values and their values line up. Oh, that's a bit different. My health and well-being are supported and encouraged. That's also very new. In Japan, the statistics I read say that basically 10% of organizations have got people with severe depression. Severe depression. And there's another 20% on top of that who've got a mild degree of depression. They're pretty big numbers in organizations. So the whole concept of that I'm the boss over here at work and you employ yourself and your private life and no contact is breaking down. And that's why what we're doing here, we think it's very interesting and very new. The people want to feel valued by your organization. And this is a direct link to getting engagement. Whereas in the past, maybe we didn't think like that. This is where we see it coming out now. So when they feel valued, it gives them confidence. It inspires them. They feel more enthusiastic. They feel more empowered. The combination of all those things is going to lead us to a higher degree of engagement. So a good manager makes people feel valued. This leads to confidence, empowerment, enthusiasm, inspiration, which in turn leads to engagement. We have not seen that connection, but the research is now showing that. So this is something a little bit new for you, which you may not have thought about before, and a whole raft of things come back into leadership and manage how we interact with people. So that, again, is something I find uh, very interesting. We sort of combine that uh, with the levels of that. You know, disengaged here, partially, fully engaged over there. And so you've got the... Um, <clears throat> the esteemed employee feels valued. Right? The energized employee feels deeply involved. Searching the manual. The enthusiastic employee feels extremely enthusiastic, obviously. And then the person who's really engaged feels a sense of ownership and commitment to the return on investment. That's at the highest level. So we put that base, we overlay this with it. This being valued, having this confidence, inspired, enthusiastic, empowered, leading something to mind. We see the big change in how we've looked at things in the past. This is in page six, I think, in your memories. Yeah, page, uh, page six and seven, and then we get on to page eight. Uh, and X, where do you think you are on the scale? Do you feel dangerous? You feel deeply involved, you feel extremely enthusiastic, you feel a sense of ownership and commitment. Where are you with an X on one of those boxes? And a star against where your team is. Okay? How you feel how you think you would rate your team on that scale? Are your team feeling a full sense of ownership and commitment? Are they extremely enthusiastic? Are they deeply involved? Do they feel valued? And if they're not on any of those, that's a different issue. But see, Start from where you think your team is, and uh, an edge from where you think you are. If emotions are leading to higher engagement, and if people need to feel valued to tri trigger that, what does that mean for you as a leader, or a manager, or as an individual in your organization? Let's have a little discussion with yourselves, and then let's get some feedback. So, where did you place yourself? Where did you place your team? What other emotions do you think might be important operating here to get people to feel more engaged? Try that. What do you think about that? Is this, is this relevant? Do you think this research is actually showing something that's relevant? Is an emotional connection going to become more important for us to have engaged people or not? What do you think? Yes. yes. Why is that? Uh, I think uh, the link there, if you feel valued, you'll be engaged. It's as a step by step, you've reached that. So, this logic works for you. Very much. You so. can see a flow there, right? Absolutely. Why would I feel that? <coughs> what would make me feel that? What would trigger that? Recognition. Recognition, yeah. Validation. What else? Validation. Validation, yeah. What else? Self confidence, yes. What else? Empowerment. Empowerment, yes. Success, yes. Camaraderie. Camaraderie, yes. Are there any other emotions do you think that might be relevant? Sense of purpose. Sense of purpose, yeah. A clear goal. Respect. Yeah. Respect. Being right. trusted. Sorry? Being trusted. Ah, yeah. Trust. How do we know those things? How do we know we're appreciated, respected, trusted? How do we know that? Feedback. Who do we get the feedback from? Immediate manager came up before, didn't it? My relationship with my immediate manager becomes very critical to how I feel engaged. 
and I have confidence in the leadership of this organization. And I feel pride in my organization. These are driving my engagement. Now, flip it around. Do the people in your organization have pride? Do they feel the senior management know what they're doing? Do they have a good relationship with their immediate manager? Does their immediate manager care about them? What people are saying is, I am not a number. Famous, right? The famous movie, right? I am not a number. Do you remember that uh, allusion to the prison cult series from the UK? I am not a number. I'm a free man. Do you remember that movie, that show? I'm not a machine. I'm not a number. I'm not an asset. I'm an individual. I want you to care how I feel. This is new. This is new. We didn't have that before. So things have moved, we've changed, and now we get into a different base. What do we do as organizations to make sure that we're getting people engaged in that new environment? And so therefore, all of those issues, those three issues become critical. They're three drivers, as I mentioned before. Here are some ideas that we've come up with. Well, we've tried to combine our experience over the last 101 years of how to make people effective in each other with these ideas that have come up through the research. So if we're talking about belief in it's actually it's in your, your manual. You know, belief in the in the seeing your team, well here are some factors, a whole list of the factors here that are critical to success there. We talk about the immediate manager, what should they be doing? In fact I think everyone has a I think you all got a golden book. You've all got those little gold books, I think, with you. Some of you got a gold ticket. Just give one to me. I'll hold it up, show people there. You've all got one of these, I think. Okay. Now, these are the 30 principles that Duncan e. came up with for effective human relations. And there are 30 stress management principles in the back of it. And we took these, we tried to do an overlay with these issues around what would give people effective belief in senior management, immediate manager, and private organization, try to do an overlay between them, so thank you. So what I'd like you can do now is have a look at this list and think about whether these actually would make a difference or not. You know, if your if your senior leadership asks for input, if they didn't criticize people, smile, you might think, well, smile. Why would that be important? Respects, you mentioned respect before, teamwork, provide resources, walk the talk. So there's some consistency there. The immediate manager becomes interested. He asks questions, right? He's a good listener. Empowers and carries, supports decisions, gives sincere appreciation, shares personal success. All those things there, then. Pride organization. So again, look at these and discuss whether you think these actually are going to work or not to have effective <coughs> engagement. So try that. So, create a culture that encourages engagement. It's a very simplistic thing to say that. You know, I can say, you know, be engaged! Come on, be engaged! <laughs> the Australian approach, yell louder, you know? It doesn't necessarily get you anywhere. So what actually would that culture be? I have to think about that. What is that culture? Where does it come back to? Where is the belief in the leadership? What the immediate managers are doing, private organization, how do you build that? And then measure it. So lots of us have engagement scores. I wonder if you go back and look at your engagement questionnaire, how many emotional points are actually being asked in those questionnaires? Go back and have a look at it and see what's being asked. It may be that same engagement survey is just been forever the same survey, and it's probably global. And I wonder if it's now out of date. Be very nice to go back and have a look at it and ask yourself, are we actually asking the right questions? And then, of course, you know, you've got the action plan to address any areas of disengagement, all very obvious. Seriously, hold me on, that is accountable for improving. In a lot of organizations, this doesn't really happen. In fact, the engagement scores come out. And they stay where they are, nothing ever seems to happen. And often it's not supported at any level, just a lot of moaning about the low numbers. It doesn't go anywhere. And then finally, recognize the real progress. So they're, they're very, very simple steps going forward. On page 11, maybe have a look at two useful ideas you got from today. Get those down and then we'll share them. So can I ask you something? Interesting point. If you believe that the trigger 
for a lot of these investors, the employees feel valued. But that is your starting point. The thing is, if you don't have that, the other parts don't flow. What makes people feel valued? And there's a whole raft of things that comes back to immediate supervisor, belief in the direction of the organisation, senior leadership, and also private organisation and impact on that. These things come together. We came back to this definition that we had. Emotional, but this is very new again, I said, this emotional context is a new piece of research. An intellectual commitment to employees to deliver high quality. It was a very energised two hours, and I think that uh, we had some great discussions, we had some very interesting oh, viewpoints. I look to see you in the next uh, workshops, or even better, see you in the Dalton Inge course. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for joining the Leadership Japan podcast. Remember to access your Dale Carnegie training, free white papers, guidebooks, training videos, blogs, course information, plus everything else. Then go to japan.dalecarnegie.com.